In the past 24 hours, Wagner Group has claimed some villages near Bakhmut. We can see from north and south that Russians have these salients, but actually this village right here, Yagidnye, Wagner claimed they have captured it. Since it is marked red on this map, it is also confirmed by military analysts. But that is not it. This village right here, Baktanivka, sources on the ground say that Wagner Group has penetrated through Ukrainian defensive lines and is storming Baktanivka. But if it is true, then taking this settlement would almost surround Bakhmut. In the next 24 hours, things will be clearer with this village. That concludes it from the north of Bakhmut, but if we go south of Bakhmut, there is a settlement called Ivanivska right here. Ukrainian side now claims that Russians are storming this settlement right now as we speak. They have renewed their attacks and they're very aggressive because if they truly take Bogdanivka and Ivanivska, then look, this cap for the Ukrainians to pull out is only 4.5 kilometers wide. Ukrainians have sent reserves and heavy equipment into Bakhmut. They are holding on to the city teeth and nails. That was Bakhmut. Remember last time I reported that Ukrainians attacked a Russian gathering area near Mariupol. Or ever since that video, ever since the very first attack, Ukrainians have not stopped. Almost daily there have been booms and bangs and Russians have been smoking carelessly near Mariupol. The Ukrainian Minister of Defense only claimed that yes, we can now strike longer distances and they have been doing that. Russians have been gathering most of their reserves and equipment near Mariupol thinking it's safe because HIMARS cannot reach it. Well, ever since last week, UK Ukrainians have been proven them wrong, destroying methodically all of these gathering areas, logistical warehouses, ammunition depots troop gathering points, Mariupol is not safe for Russians anymore. The situation very much resembles to what happened to Kherson and the surrounding areas before Ukrainians captured the entire area. First of all, they destroyed all of the logistical warehouses, then they let the Russian army feel the attrition for some time, then they stormed in. The same thing is happening because if you take away the logistics of Mariupol and Berdyansk, this entire area here will have attrition. Add time to the equation, I think in two months we can see this big Ukrainian counteroffensive striking somewhere here and cutting the Russian land connection to Crimea in half. That's my prediction. These are Russian losses in the last 24 hours. We have 12 tanks, that means they have renewed their attacks on Vugledar, Bahmut, 9 armored vehicles, 10 artillery, and of course the important thing to mention is trucks, 11 trucks. Trucks are the key to Russian logistics now that railways don't connect directly to the fronts. Take away these trucks, you also take away the tanks and the armored vehicles because they need fuel and ammunition which are transported by trucks. So Ukrainians know this and they're methodically destroying any moving Russian truck they see. Now we have the update from Bakhmut. I've watched in every video. I really enjoy this officer's analytics and I've noticed in the comments, so do you. So we're going to continue watching his thoughts. Vitania, Ukraina. Всем доброго ранку. Сьогодні 24 лютого. 24 лютого рівно рік назад почалась гаряча фаза війни, яка триває з 2014 року, а взагалі, яка йде вже декілька століть, більше як 500 років між Московією See, that's what I like about this officer, because he brings the historical aspect and the bigger picture into it. It's not only about Bakhmut. I like it. Та Україна є. Друзі, що можна констатувати? Нашим предкам, на жаль, не вдалося за ці століття подолати, здолати імперію. Так складалось історично, геополітично. Не було в нас сил виграти цю війну. Але наразі нашому поколінню випала така доля закрити це питання, розбити Московію і стати нарешті вільною і незалежною країною. Чим ми наразі займаємося? Із 24 лютого, такі як Киянин, Брат Фокс, Відьма, Вурдалак і багато інших козаків, сотня тисяч по всій Україні, встали, взяли зброю і пішли відвоювати свою незалежність. Пройшовши через рік війни, можна констатувати, що міг про Вторую армію світу це велика купа гівна, самого натурального, брехливого, лайливого, бездумного, не маючи власних збройних сил, які здохли під Києвом, там, на Харківщині, в Херсоні. Вони набрали зеків, намагалися там 
щось з ними зробити, виздихали зеки. Зараз будуть набирати нових чмобіків, намагатися зламати наш дух. Але все то байдуже. Українців всім не зламати. Брат Фокс, скажи пару слів. Що можу сказати? Росія – це країна паразит. Якщо дивилися колись, є такий фільм старий, називається «Десь незалежності», який на планетяні... They're quoting the, they're connecting it to the Independence Day. What legends! I'm sure these two guys just gained a whole bunch of American fans. Якщо коротко, стосовно ситуації в місті Бахмут, 24 лютого, то ситуація там, да, тяжка. Вони лізуть, як таргани, пруть, ну, це оце безсміття суїцидальне. У них всіх національна ідея усім померти під Бахмутом. Просто це вершина героїзму. Але, щоб було зрозуміло, і в цих нелюдських умовах Бахмут стоїть, Бахмут тримається, Бахмут – це Україна. І буде тривати, стояти доти, доки буде потрібно українському народу. Наразі Бахмут їм взяти не вдається. Yeah, the security situation only changed about 10-15 hours ago near Bahmut when uh, Wagner troops or Russian troops, we don't know which are they because they fight, they in fights a lot. Those two villages north and south from Bahmut I talked about, they supposedly have been occupied or are being stormed as we speak. This situation is of course two days old and, and we will find out what will happen. But I have reported for months on Bahmut, oh it's gonna fall, it's gonna fall. It hasn't fallen. Ukrainians have proven they are able to hold it against any and all odds. So even now, if, even if they have this four kilometer gap only and the almost entire settlement, the city is surrounded, They can still hold if they want to. То, що вони там спробували оточення роблять уже якийсь час. Вони там лізуть, дохнуть, щось одрізають там по метру, по сантиметру. Але Бахмут перебуває під українським прапором. По секторах детально не буду говорити, що там як відбувається. На місці є побратим Мадьяр. Побратим Моталайв, буде можливість, вони вийдуть і розкажуть по ситуації більш, скажімо так, розширено. Наразі все, що вам треба знати, це, що Бахмут під українським прапором, там знаходяться наші підрозділи. Там ми несемо втрати, ми за них ніколи не говоримо. The thing is also, Russia knows that Ukraine is preparing for a big counterattack. Everybody knows this. And how to disrupt, like Russia is not really able to do much about it. But what they can do is, yes, suicidally, suicidally storm Bahmut. It is possibly one of the weakest points in the Ukrainian defensive line. And if Russia threatens it enough, Ukraine is forced to send reinforcements into Bahmut. All reserves sent to Bahmut is less reserves allocated to the one big counter-offensive that comes later. This is how Russia disrupts Ukrainian preparation for this counter-offensive. They force Ukraine to move around the reserves by attacking one area very strongly, for example. Unfortunately, this storming of Bahmut has effects on the future counter-offensive and it takes away from the capabilities of it. Ukraine has to move their reserves into Bahmut. They already have. But this is the price of freedom. And the other thing is that it's not our choice. Тварюки, які прийшли на нашу землю, зробили а, так, що ми без вибору мусимо воювати з ними. Але е, після ночі завжди приходить день, ми отримуємо західну допомогу і нарешті буде в нас багато озброєння. І потім цих тварюк знищимо до голови на теренах нашої ні, е, ненькі України. Тому все, що на сьогодні потрібно знати, Бахмут – це Україна, вірте збройним силам. Не хвилюйтеся, тримайте стрій, слава нація, смерть ворогам. First leopard tanks have arrived in Ukraine and I have a very interesting unboxing video for you. Let's watch it. This is a leopard driving on Ukrainian soil, trying to, you know, find its way to Moscow. We have waited for this site for months. It's here, my friends. Let's appreciate this beautiful <laughs> so as m sorry if i'm making any mistakes but this is klitschko right i mean boxing champion of the world 
also the mayor of Kiev. They're Klitschko brothers. I, I mess them up all the time, which one is which. But uh, <laughs> this is the mayor of Kiev driving a leopard in Ukraine, <laughs> trying to find his way towards Moscow. How cool is that? February 24th, a year later. I never thought a year ago that I'm going to drive this cat. A year of war in Ukraine, a year of suffering, and a year of getting our willpower stronger than ever. As strong as this tank. Thank you, Germany. Thank you, the free world. For all that you do for us, Ukrainians. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. Slava Ukraini. We talk about Zelensky all the time, but actually Klitschko, the boxing champion of the world, the mayor of Kiev, he also stayed in Kiev when the attack happened. He, he is a hero in my eyes also, and hero for the Ukrainian people. What a legend. Also, yes, thank you, Germany. We gotta give some slack to the Germans. They pulled through in the end. Leopards are in Ukraine. And now by bigger and bigger numbers every week or month, that is thanks to the Germans. What a moment. We see Ukrainian armed forces getting leopards and getting more Western capabilities, becoming more and more powerful and preparing themselves for this big counterattack that I am predicting in two months. What about the Russian military situation in Ukraine? I will bring you a man who I would have never thought I'm showing on this channel, the war criminal Igor Kirkin. He is waiting for his hog trials right now patiently. But I gotta say this. He is pro-Russia in any way possible. But he criticizes the Russian Minister of Defense and Putin for handling this war poorly in his eyes. And he's right. Russian Minister of Defense is handling this war horribly. This man should be tried in hog, but I think he sees the Russian Minister of Defense clearly than the ministers themselves do. Let's see what he has to say about the situation. Lent Lisa, масштабного, в том числе Lent Lisa боеприпасов, Lent Lisa снарядов, Парахов артиллерийских, которых у нас катастрофически не хватает, в основном по этой причине у нас выпас боеприпасов э, недостаточен. Мы не то что воевать сколь угодно долго не сможем, мы просто можем оказаться голы и боссы во всех отношениях перед противником уже в середине. He's a terrorist, he's a war criminal, but these are the words that I would use if I would describe the Russian situation. So... I find myself in a weird position where I agree with him, and I, it's weird. And you know, thank God that the Russian Ministry of Defense is so corrupt, they don't trust this guy, they don't want to connect themselves with this guy, and they don't listen to him. Unfortunately, he would give the proper advice to the Ministry of Defense, which uh, we don't want. Let them continue making the mistakes, like Napoleon said, don't interrupt your enemy when they're making the mistakes. Well, I don't have any Russians watching me, so let's carry on analyzing the Russian mistakes или даже к концу этого года зависит от интенсивности боевых действий. Уже сейчас батальоны мобилизованных и другие части в значительной степени не могут быть снабжены боевой техникой согласно штатным расписаниям и по факту переформируются в обычные легкопехотные стрелковые с минимумом боевой техники или вообще без нее. Поэтому мы не можем сформировать те четыре артиллерийские дивизии, которые собирался сформировать господин Шойгу, у нас нету для этого пушек. Более того, через какое-то время мы не сможем заменять даже вышедшие из строя. Chinese lend lease, what he was mentioning at the beginning. The only way Russia can continue this war long term or have, or have any kind of victories on the battlefields in the future is if China starts a very powerful lend lease project weapons, ammunition, equipment, everything. If they don't do that, Russia is doomed. We know it, I know it, he knows it. The only one who doesn't know it is Putin and the Ministry of Defense of Russia. And they make the decisions. But the truth is, they're, they're screwed. Lacking everything from equipment to weapons, light arms even. The only options for Russia to maintain any kind of victories on the battlefield is to declare a new mobilization and to have a lend lease right now with China. Артиллерийские системы, ну, подчеркиваю, в достаточном количестве заменять. Не говоря уже о том, что наши изумительные генералы во главе с Кретином Герасимовым просто... You can see how Kirkin sees uh, Kerasimov. It's the same way precaution sees Kerasimov and Kadyrov. Spiral of infighting the Russian leaders are going into. 
жгут и бросают технику в таких количествах, что никакая промышленность не выдержит. 450 бронеединиц, которые бросили под изюмом, ну, yeah. извините, это потери бронетехники, сравнимые с потерями немцев в Курской битве. И то они, наверное, меньше потеряли. Вас, какой восторг. See, this man also knows his history. I mean, yeah, it's a horrible loss they had at Izium. Uh, Ukraine came out of Izium with double the amount of armored vehicles than they went into Izium. What happened there? Russian Ministry of Defense and Corruption and all of that stuff. Kirke knows this. I know this. Don't tell it to the Ministry of Defense. I mean, you can. They don't listen anyway. Поэтому позиция Китая, которая единственный может дать нам ленд чтобы продолжать эту войну сколько-нибудь успешно и чтобы победить в ней. Она сейчас критически важна. I don't like the fact that he is right. China has the possibility, if they give this land lease, if they would, I'm not saying they do, but if they would, that would really, really be bad for Ukraine. That would give Russia the capabilities they're lacking right now. Also give them a capability to wage this for war for years. Right now Russia doesn't have this capability. They think they do, but they don't. China has that capability. Let's hope USA has enough willpower and means to stop China from doing that. Kirkin was talking about Russia throwing away armor needlessly connected to Izium front, but it's not only Izium. I will bring you now a video showing Russian daily attacks near Vugladar. Look at this video. All the fields are mined. These attacks occur one, two, three times a day. We see three armored vehicles, tanks or ACPs, driving full throttle on the road because the fields are mines. And immediately if they reach to the point where the last attack ended because there's a ton of destroyed vehicles there, the first one hits a mine. What does the second one do? Immediately turn around and speed back. And the third one does the same. If you add Benny Hill music to it, you get a comedy. This is what they do. I'm not going to show it, but the second one also got destroyed. That happens three times a day there. If that is not throwing away your armored vehicles, I don't know what is. It is not a strategic, well-thought-through plan of attack. It is a toddler playing chess. Pfft, you know, pieces all over the place. That's how the Russian Ministry of Defense operates in my eyes. The European Union Security Summit was held in Austria. The Austrians did not have the balls to ban Russians from entering. Russia is a country sponsored by terrorism, that is the EU opinion, and Austrians let them enter and let them take part in this summit. Not cool, Austria, not cool. This is what the Latvian representative had to say about this during the summit. We need to watch this, it's very important. This is Richard Kohl's representative of, of Latvia. Talk right now that, you know, we stand up to our principles and values and statutes. We don't. I mean, there's an elephant in this room, which is called by name Russian Federation delegation. I mean, if, if they are witnesses, if I were a witness and somebody asked me, who is the war criminal? Well, I would point to the back benches in this room. And it's just... It's just this great. See, they're it's clapping, they're clapping. I mean, what the hell, Austria? Why the hell did you leave them, let them enter? It's a unified opinion in the EU and in NATO that Russia is a war criminal. You should not have dialogue with them anymore. And Austria is like, yeah, let the Russians come. No, no, we should talk about this. The time of talk is over. Listen to this Latvian man speaking. He speaks the truth. This phrase that this delegation is here particularly the delegation that consists of members who are sanctioned individuals who voted to annex independent countries' territories. Donbass, Kherson, Zaporizhia Oblast, Lugansk. Those are the principles this institution was vouched to protect and guard. Yeah. And we, we, we're sitting like nothing happened. You know, I would use the momentum. And apologies, Mr. Go Chair. for it, my man, go I for it. Will and convey a message to the Russian Federation, sit yeah. delegation sitting in this room. And I will call the Ukrainian border guards. Ruski, Vayeni, Karabin, Pashol, Nahui. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is what I needed to hear. That is the truth. Latvia, a small country like Estonia and Lithuania. You can hear the truth from us. If Austrians don't have the balls to do it or say it, listen to this man. What happened after it? Well, Rus of Austrians, of course, gave Russians the ability to speak in this summit. Let's all listen to what they have to speak. And what happened then is this. This is when the Russian delegation started to speak. Everybody standing up. Everybody standing up. 
And the courtman is like, please, please sit down, please sit down. We're listening to the Russian delegation. No, screw you, man. Walk out. Don't listen to that crap. Look, everybody's walking out. These are not just people. These are people representing the opinions of countries, entire countries, world's most powerful countries. And they're walking out when Russia speaks. <laughs> the summit is not over. I mean, Russia's speaking. Nobody cares. The fun story was I was actually in the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, yeah, Foreign Ministry, actually. When this meeting was going on and there were people sitting in front of the computers taking part of this meeting, you know, virtually. And they said that, yes, we have coordinated this walkout. You know, they were so excited about this. So it was weird to like be a part of the behind the scenes of this action. It was coordinated with entire. This walkout was coordinated beforehand. And then they put the Ukrainian flag in front and behind of the Russian delegation speaking. <laughs> what legends! Look at this. They're making pictures of them. Yeah, this is the right way to act right now towards Russia. Austrians, get the shit together. A Russian tank entered Estonia. I would have never thought that I would say these words. But fortunately, it was destroyed before it reached our border. Ukrainians did it for us. The destroyed Russian T-72 went to Thailand for Estonians to see. They're now exhibited in the Estonian's Freedom Square outside the Russian embassy in Riga and Cathedral Square in Vilnius. All of the Baltics can admire the Ukrainian good work. Thank you, Ukrainians. My friends, I will now take this moment to thank the Patreons. I'm recently involved in some charity project for the Ukrainian Armed Forces. That means I don't accept ads because it would be weird to promote an ad and a Ukrainian charity at the same video and it would be ethically very wrong. So I rely on Patreons and I accept ads extremely minimal right now. I'm going to butcher the names of five new Patreons who are tier 10 and above. Ola Jon Bjorkum, Mostly Harmless, Paul Mak, Patrikia Meri, Prant P. Courier. If you like this channel, Patreon is in the description below. Also subscribe to this channel to be notified about my future uploads. And as always, my friends, until my next video, Slavo Ukraine.